are up. Let's go to section 136 and to verse 34. We read, thy brethren have rejected you and your testimony, even the nation that has driven you out. And now cometh the day of their calamity, even the days of sorrow, like a woman that is taken in travail. And their sorrow shall be great unless they speedily repent, yea, very speedily. In other words, when this revelation comes, we're within 15 years of the great civil war. For they killed the prophets, Joseph and Hiram Smith, and them that were sent unto them. They have shed innocent blood, which crieth from the ground against them. Two great revelations in dealing with the conflict. Let's go back now to section 87. And just before we start into these verses, I share something else with you. Joseph Smith on June 25th, 1844, is in the Carthage jail when he speaks to the guards who are there by the steps and by the landing to that second floor and asks them if, if they can see anything about him that would show he's such a dangerous character. And they said, no, but we can't see your heart. And he said, that's true. You can't see my heart, but I can see yours. And then he makes this prophecy. He says, I can see that you thirst for blood and nothing but my blood will satisfy you. It's not for crime of any description that I and my brethren are thus continually persecuted and harassed by our enemies, but there are other motives, and some of them I have expressed, so far as relates to myself, and inasmuch as you and the people thirst for blood, I prophesy in the name of the Lord that you shall witness scenes of blood and sorrow to your entire satisfaction. Your souls shall be perfectly satiated with blood. And many of you who are now present shall have an opportunity to face the cannon's mouth from sources you think not of. And those people that desire this great evil upon me and my brethren shall be filled with regret and sorrow because of the scenes of desolation and distress that await them. They shall seek for peace and shall not be able to find it. Gentlemen, you will find what I have told you to be true. That's History of the Church, Volume 6, page 566. Volume 6, page 566. Now, one more prophecy, and I share this with you because this revelation, as I said, deals with wars, not just civil war, but wars. President George Albert Smith at the end of the World War II conflict, sent Elder Ezra Taft Benson, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, who was one of the junior members at that time, to war-torn Europe, to assess the needs of the saints, to see what missions we could open, and to determine what mission presence would be sent. In one of the meetings, he made this statement. He said, the Lord in his mercy has provided a way of escape. The voice of warning is to all people by the mouths of his servants. If this voice is not heeded, the angels of destruction will go forth again. The chastening hand of Almighty God will be felt upon the nations as decreed, until a full end thereof will be the result. Wars, devastation, untold suffering will be your lot, except you turn unto the Lord in humble repentance." Destruction even more terrible and far-reaching than intended the war just ended, which is World War II, will come with certainty unless rulers and people alike repent and cease their evil and godless ways. God will not be mocked. He will not permit sins of immorality, thievery, deceit, Sabbath-breaking, disregard for all his holy commandments, and the messages of his servants to go unheeded without grievous punishment for such wickedness. The nations of Europe and of the world cannot endure in sin. The way of escape is clear. The immutable laws of God remain steadfastly in the heavens above. When men and nations refuse to abide by them, the penalty must follow. They will be wasted away. Sin cannot endure. That is a prophecy of the great world war that will yet come. The scriptures refer to it as Gog and Magog. The more uh, common title that's used, at least in the Christian world, is the Battle of Armageddon. 
or Daniel calls it the abomination of desolation. So it's got three different titles to it. President Benson says it will be far more destructive than anything this world has ever seen. Elder McConkie states that he believes that in that conflict, one-third of all of Earth's inhabitants will be killed. We are now talking not millions, but billions who will die in that great conflict. How will we get through it? I don't know. Just keep the commandments. The Lord will watch over us and take care of us. Now, with that much in mind, let's start in section 87 with verse 1. Verily thus saith the Lord concerning the wars, no plural, that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. Here's some quick statistics. In the Union, 360,000 died. In the Confederate, 258,000 died. For a total of 618,000 men that was killed in that conflict, over a million casualties that were wounded. Illinois itself lost 35,000 men, helping to fulfill the prophecy of Joseph Smith. Verse 2, the time will come that war will be poured out upon all nations, beginning at this place. This place is South Carolina. The conflict erupted on April 12th is when the first shot was fired, April 12th, 1861, at a Union garrison, which was Fort Sumter. That is where the first shot was fired. He says, Behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern states. The southern states will call on other nations, even the nation of Great Britain, as it is called, call on them for help. They called on England, France, and Holland and Belgium, and four different countries, to help them, as it is called. And they, the antecedent of they is other nations, and I just listed the four for you. They shall also call upon other nations, which now includes the United States, in order to defend themselves against other nations. And then war shall be poured out upon all nations. That is reference to World War I and to World War II that will erupt in which millions and millions will be slaughtered. Now, verse 4, an interesting verse and easily one that's misunderstood. It shall come to pass after many days. Now, note... He's already has moved us in the wars up past World War II. And now he says, after many days, slaves shall rise up against their masters who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. It does not have reference to the blacks who are in slavery rising up during the Civil War and after. It has reference to the slaves in the nations, particularly the Soviet Union and some of the European nations that will rise up in rebellion against their masters. Here is a prophetic statement and uh, an interesting discourse from Elder Joseph L. Worthland. He said this, In many cases, I am quite sure we all think this has to do particularly with the slaves in the southern states, but I believe, brethren and sisters, that it was intended that this referred to slaves all over the world. And I think of those particularly in the land of Russia and other countries wherein they have been taken over by that great nation and where the people are actually the slaves of those individuals who guide and direct the affairs of Russia and China, where the rights and the privileges to worship God and to come to a knowledge that Jesus Christ is his son is denied them. The reference for that, Joseph L. Worthland, is conference report, October 1958, page 32, October 1958, page 32. We have not seen the complete fulfillment of verse 4, but we see them rise up. We've seen it in uh, Africa. We've seen it in various places in Europe. We have seen the Soviet Union come down and other nations established, such as the Ukraine and so forth. Now, verse 5. It's come to pass also that the remnants who are left of the land will marshal themselves and shall become exceedingly angry. She'll vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. I'll give you three references. We'll have time to look at only one of them that explains verse 5. Micah 
chapter 5, verse 7 through 15. If you want to be turning to that, that's what I'm going to look at. Micah 5, 7 through 15. Third Nephi, chapter 20, verse 10 through 22. Third Nephi 20, 10 through 22, Doctrines of Salvation. Volume 2, page 249 and 250. Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, 249, 250. Those all are helpful references. But let's look at this one in Micah, where the language is so very similar. So we're going to start in chapter 5, verse 7. He says, And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as the dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Now, so there's no misunderstanding with the members of the church. We were not sent to the earth to kill human beings. That's not our work. So when it speaks of us being like lions, going through sheep and cutting them down. All it means is this, that the members of the church will have power over the Gentiles. We will move into all nations at the appointed time. They cannot keep us out. The Son of God owns this earth. We go at his direction as he speaks through the prophet. We will enter every nation before the winding up scene, and we will teach and we will have power over the Gentiles. They cannot stop us. Verse 9, thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses. Horses in that verse is the symbol of war and destruction and military power. <coughs> Out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots, thy war machines. I will cut off the cities of thy land, throw down all thy stronghold. Nations that try to stop the work of God will come down. I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy land, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers, those who are evil and wicked. Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee. Thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. I will pluck up the groves, uh, and I apologize for not taking time to explain all of the symbols here. Out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen. Heathen are Gentiles, such as they have never heard. We're starting to see a glimpse of it. The plagues, the pollutions, the fires, the hurricanes, and, and all of the elements in commotion throughout the world. And yet, even as members of the church, sometimes we don't tie all that in with the scriptures and the foretold events that are being unfolded right before our eyes as we approach the winding up scene with the Son of God. We are in process now of making final preparation for His return, and He will come as He promised. Let's go back to uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 6. And thus with a sword and by bloodshed, the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn, that's being fulfilled, with famine, plague, earthquake, the thunder of heaven, the fierce and vivid lightning also being fulfilled. Shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of an almighty God until the consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations. Reference to eventually the second coming and the removing of the wicked off of this planet. And that'll be a wonderful day. We do not rejoice in the destruction of the wicked, but the fact that there will be peace on the earth, those who are righteous will be with the Savior, is the day we have longed for and look forward to. It will come. Seven, that the cry of the saints and of the blood of saints shall cease to come up in the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth is the Hebrew for host. It denotes a god of war. What does he war against? He wars against sin and wickedness. Where is the great discourse on that? It's Isaiah 13, verse 1 through 4. And I think uh, maybe if we hurry, I'll take just a minute and help you with this one. 
Let's go to Isaiah chapter 13. Okay, verse 1. The burden of Babylon. Burden there means the judgments. Babylon is the world. Which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Denotes he is a seer. He sees the future. Lift up a banner. The banner. The standard. The ensign. All the same thing. The restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The establishment of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Upon the high mountain. Meaning it will be put where all can see it. Mountain is just symbolic of the fact that it will be where all can see it. Look at what the church is doing to help people to see that this is God's kingdom. The many, many things that are happening. He says, exalt the voice. Exalt means raise. Raise the voice unto them. Them is Israel. Shake the hand. To shake the hand is to give the signal. What is the signal? The gospel has been restored. Repent or perish and come into the fold, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. That is a reference to Zion. Nobles denotes an exalted character. I have commanded my sanctified ones. The word that goes there is saints. The word saint means holy ones. I have also called my mighty ones, or the warriors. Israel means soldier or warrior. For mine anger, and now the prophet corrects it, for mine anger is not uh, upon them that rejoice in my highness or his glory or his goodness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts denotes a God of war. He wars against sin. Mustereth the host. Mustereth means enlist. The host of the battle. Who is the host that he musters? We are. We are Israel. We are his soldiers, his warriors. What is the battle he enlists us in? The war against sin and evil throughout the world. And it's a tremendous conflict. It commenced in pre-earth life. We simply switched battlefields. It rages in all of its fury. And unfortunately, even with some of those elect, they have decided not to participate anymore. And I've left the kingdom of God and have gone the way of the world. And that is tragic beyond words that that is happening to a handful of our, our wonderful people. I hope somebody can bring them back. Okay, I would note by verse 7 these references. Doctrine and Covenants 88, verse 94. And Revelation 11, which deals with the martyrdom of some of the saints. Even today, we're not sure of how many were killed at Far West, but there were quite a few. We've had missionaries who've been killed in the nations of the earth. Maybe you know of some who have lost their lives. We've had members of the church who've been killed. You generally don't hear about that because the church does not publicize that, and you can see why they don't do that. We don't need to draw attention to what the wicked are doing. Eight, wherefore stand ye in holy places? Holy places is temples, homes, wherever righteous people stand, that is a holy place. Be not moved. When you see the wars and the elements in commotion, do not be moved. Stand and fight in the conflict, and all will be well. Until the day of the Lord come. So until the day he comes, there will be wars and calamities. We have to stand in place and serve and do the best we can. For behold, it cometh quickly, saith the Lord, amen. That was said uh, almost 200 years ago. So how close are we getting to the coming of the Son of God? I would note by that verse this reference. Dallin Oaks, Conference Report, April 2004, page 8. Dallin Oaks, Conference Report, April 2004, page 8. Let's go to section 88. In 86, it dealt with the separation of the wheat and the tares. 87, wars. 88 deals with peace, a message of peace. So after you've been through those two, you're ready for the third one now to have some information on peace and what the great God of heaven is going to do. And watch the significant promises that's in this section. 
Verse 1, Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you who have assembled yourselves. Here is who you is. And you might want to write them down. You will have trouble finding these. I'll give you the reference, but you'll still have trouble uh, finding it. Here's who he's speaking to, and he says, you, Joseph Smith Sr., Joseph Smith Jr., Hiram Smith, Samuel Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Orson Hyde, Newell K. Whitney, there's a marvelous man. Joseph Smith said he was a direct descendant of Melchizedek and Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Frederick G. Williams, Ezra Thayer, and John Murdoch. Ten, that's who you is. Unfortunately, eight of those will stay faithful. Two don't. And that's Sidney Rigdon, who will leave the kingdom of God, and Ezra Thayer. When Brigham Young excommunicated Sidney Rigdon, September 1844, he said, I now turn Sidney Rigdon over to the buffetings of the devil till the day of redemption comes in his behalf. He has suffered and probably will continue to suffer for a long time. Ezra Thayer was a member of the first quorum of 70 who leaves the church and joins eventually with a reorganized movement. Anyway, that's who you is. And then he says, uh, verse 2, Behold, this is pleasing unto your Lord. The angels rejoice over you. The alms of your prayers. Alms means works of righteousness, means offering, and it means charity. Have come up into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, have explained, are recorded in the book of the names of the sanctified, even them of the celestial world. That book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. I'll give you some references. We'll look at one of them. That book contains, contains the names of those who will have eternal life. What do you have to do to get your name in the book? You have to become a baptized member of the church. You keep the commandments, you receive the ordinances, and your name will always be there. And in the great day when that's opened, your name will be read, that you will have eternal life. Now, what do you have to do to get it out? Commit sin, serious sin. All have sinned, even those whose names are there, but through sincere repentance, their names are left. It's the Lamb's book of life. And when it says Lamb, it has reference to the atonement. Whenever you see that title used in scriptures, it means atonement. Why is that important to know that? Because it means that those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life are fully covered by his atonement. They have been healed by that power, and they are pronounced clean. Now, I mentioned, uh, on a look at least one reference, let's go to Alma chapter 5. Alma 5, verse uh, 58. This great prophet testified, For the names of the righteous shall be written in the book of life, and unto them will I grant an inheritance on my right hand. Now that's important. The right hand is the covenant hand. The Son of God stands on the right hand of the Father. Do you know why he does? Because he's the heir. The birthright goes to him. He earned it. He's entitled to it. If we're faithful and our names are recorded in his book, we will stand where? On his right hand, the right hand of Christ, meaning we are joint heirs. He shares his birthright. There isn't anybody like him in all eternity except for the Father, that he loved us so much that he would pay a price that we could be healed and then turn around and share his birthright with us. Uh, it'll be a thrill to be in his presence one day. Also, with that, let me give you a couple of other references if you would like them. The Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 9. And again, I caution you with that one. There are so many additions to that that when you look there and you don't find it's not on that page, it's because you have a different edition than I do. So the key, and I mentioned I think this before, to finding that is you start with page 1 and read till you find it. It's in there someplace. Okay, 
So I, I apologize for that. When I give you the reference on the teachings, I hope that is not going to cause you a lot of problems. But the pages are off, depending on the additions that you have. But at least you know there's something significant there. I'd also put Doctrine and Covenants 128, verse 7, where it says that it's a record kept in heaven. That means that it ensures accuracy. There's no mistakes made if it's kept in heaven. I'd also note Revelation 3, verse 5. Revelation 3, 5. Okay, verse 3. Wherefore, I now send upon you another comforter, even upon you, my friends. Now, imagine the Son of God saying to those ten men, you are what? You are my friends. I trust you. You are loyal to me and worthy of my love and blessings. Therefore, I'm going to send another comforter. When he says another comforter, it means someone like the Savior. It's not the Savior in this case. It's someone like him who will take his place and do his work. The other comforter is the Holy Ghost, which is given to you and I when we're baptized. The gift is given. Whether or not the Holy Ghost takes up his abode with us depends on how uh, much you want him to. You have to ask. If you think you can get up each day and the Holy Ghost is just going to be with you through the day, then you don't understand the Scriptures. First Nephi 10 makes it clear you must diligently seek the Holy Ghost, which means you have to be consistent. I would suggest to members of the church that every single morning you pray for the companionship of the Holy Ghost, that he'll be with you and that he will help you. We should ask. It's, all that is, brothers and sisters, is being courteous, is it not? that we ask and not assume that because we're members of the church, Father in Heaven's obligated to make sure the Holy Ghost helps us. You have to want His companionship. So I suggest that you and I must ask for it. Let's come down to uh, verse 6. He says, He, Christ, that ascended up on high to celestial worlds, has, as also He descended below all things. We will have to be exalted beings to understand that second part. In the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, everything he went through in the garden, he had to go back through on that cross. And he didn't just descend to our level to take upon him our weaknesses and the things we do wrong. He even went into the realm of perdition to the abyss. There is nothing he does not understand. Who could imagine the horror of what Satan poured out on him? in that garden and on that cross. Anyone who's ever had a, tent, a taste of the damned and the darkness that's there knows of the horror of that domain and of Satan in his world. You don't want any part of that. It's, it's, it's horrible beyond anything you can ever begin to imagine. He descended then below all things. I would note by it, Alma 7, verse 12, where it gives an explanation as to why he did that, Alma 7, 12. I'd also note DNC 122, verse 8, which also is a helpful verse. In that he comprehended all things. Let's go over here for a minute. We'll come back. But let's go over to verse 41. This is the only verse in all of Scripture that explains how it is God knows all things. 41, he comprehendeth all things. All things are before him. All things are round about him. He is above all things and in all things and is through all things. He is round about all things. All things are by him and of him, even God forever and ever. In other words, he knows all things. And he is in the heart of eternity and everything surrounds him. And he comprehends and understands all of it. He's going to give us a little glimpse of that. And there's no need. I learned a long time ago. You only teach to the level of your understanding. If you go beyond that and speculate or give your opinion, the Holy Ghost will leave. And members of the church will leave Sunday school or other settings and say, did you understand that? I, I'm confused. So which way is that? Never go beyond the level of your understanding. Never. And it does not hurt to say, I don't know the answer to that.
In fact, that's a great feeling because then you can move on. You tell them, I don't know what that means. Let's move on. And I've been in the presence of leaders of the church and I've heard them say that. I don't know the answer uh, to that. Okay. I would note, uh, let's see. Well, let me give it to you here. I'd put by that 2 Nephi chapter 9, verse 20. Let's look at that one. This is not an isolated reference. There are multiple references on this. Now, I know in the Journal of Discourses, Seth Wilford Woodruff and Brigham Young and others are quoted that God is ever learning. I don't know if that's transcribed correctly or not. I don't know why they said that. When you see them someday, ask them uh, about that, because I see members refer to that. I know with my church calling an assignment, we will not allow Journal of Discourses references to go through in publications unless there's another source that collaborates it. We become very, very careful with that. Okay, 2 Nephi 9.20. Oh, how great the holiness of our God. For he knoweth all things, and there's not anything save he knows it. That takes care of that. That's an absolute. God knows all things. In the lectures on faith, Joseph Smith said, you cannot worship a being that is ever learning. That is terrifying. And that verse 41 in section 88 gives a glimpse, even though it's very difficult for you and I to understand, how it is that God knows all things. He comprehendeth all things because he's in the heart of eternity, and all things come from him and all things surround him. Okay, verse 7. Which truth shineth, this is the light of Christ. Now, I'm going to give you a reference to help with this because it's more than we teach. We teach that everybody's born with the light of Christ. That's a little tiny part of that, which is given to every human being so they know what? Right from wrong. As they grow, if they will sustain the right, they can come to a point where they can have the Holy Ghost. We will look for them and find them and teach them. If, once you remember, you respond to the Holy Ghost, he will bring you to another comforter level, which is Christ himself, where we will be in his presence. And for most of us, that's going to be in the millennial reign when that finally happens. He, Christ, when the work is finished, will take us to the Father. So we are ascending back to the Father in stages and degrees. And we will make it. Savior not going to lose any of us. I've always told people and will continue to do so. There's two things you have to do. You have to try and you have to have a good attitude. If you can do those two things, the Son of God will not lose us. Okay, the light of Christ is the power of God. That's what the Father has chosen to put on this substance or whatever it is. He has called it the light of Christ. The reference is Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1. Page 52 and 53, volume 1, 52, 53. The light of Christ, this power, originates with God the Father. The fullness of it now goes through the Son. He has a fullness of all that the Father has. It is a spiritual power that emanates from God. Now, he gives us glimpses of what this power does and can do. So let's now look at it. He says, this is the light of Christ is also he is in the sun, the light of the sun, the power thereof. Eight, he's the power, uh, excuse me, uh, as also he is in the moon and is the light of the moon, the power thereof. Nine is also the light of the stars, the power thereof. Ten, also, uh, and the earth also, the power thereof. Okay. The light of Christ is a creative power. There's one thing we know about it. It is a creative power. That's why the sun exists. That's why the moon exists. The stars exist. That's why the earth exists is because of the light of Christ. The earth is a living creation. Eleven. And the light <coughs> which shineth giveth you light is through him who enlighteneth your eyes. No, it is an enlightening power. An enlightening power. I'd put by that Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1, page 51. Volume 1, page 51. 
Verse 12, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God not to fill the immensity of space. I mean, that is absolutely mind-boggling, is it not? That there's a being in the heart of the universe that is the power, the power that goes through him, the light of Christ, is what sustains all things in the universe, gives light and life and enlightens all things. God is far more infant than you and I can ever fathom as mortal beings. But we have faith that he will bring us to understand step by step, and he will help and enlighten us. 13, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things. Note then uh, that it is a life-giving power. Also in 12, I missed that one. It fills the immensity of space. That's another one. Fills the immensity of space. 13, it's a life-sustaining power, which is the law by which all things are governed. Note, it's a power by which things are governed or controlled. Okay, the Savior has helped us to that extent. With the light of Christ, we will be a long, long time in eternity before we can fully comprehend or enjoy that kind of power. But we are the children of a loving Father in heaven, and he will eventually bring us back into his presence, and we will enjoy eternal life with his Holy Son and with him. Let's go down to uh, verse 14. Now, verily I say unto you that through the redemption which is made for you is brought to pass the resurrection from the dead. The redemption he speaks of is the atonement of Christ which is brought about the resurrection. 15, and the spirit and the body are the soul of man. That's a refinement from the Book of Mormon. Note in the Book of Mormon that soul is just used for spirit. That's all right. That was the extent of their knowledge. Unless you're going like this, you're willing to climb this way, you can stay back here. If you want to keep throwing up uh, in church settings, well, in the Book of Mormon, it says, well, in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord did this. And if you want to stay back with Brigham Young, then you can stay back there. Or you can move with President Nelson, who keeps adding and teaching and helping and enlightening us. And that's the key, brothers and sisters. Don't get hung up on hobby horses where you have read that this is what it says, and it can't be any different than that because we are moving this way and growing in light and truth. So the Lord refines what the soul is. He says it's the spirit and the body. That's an addition to the Book of Mormon and very helpful to us. And the resurrection from the dead is the redemption of the soul. It's the bringing of the spirit back into the physical body. That is the redemption. The redemption of the soul is through him, Christ, that quickeneth all things. And whose bosom is decreed that the poor and the meek, the poor and the meek are those who are submissive, patient, and humble and modest. He speaks of faithful members of the church. That the poor and the meek of the earth shall inherit it. The antecedent of it is the earth. Therefore, it, earth, must needs be sanctified two ways. The same two that you and I are. First, it had to be baptized. And the baptism did what? It removed the wicked, cleansed the earth, got rid of them. And so there's only eight righteous souls. So that's first step for the earth. It had to be baptized to become sanctified. Second, it has to be cleansed by fire, same as you and I. The Holy Ghost is the refiner's fire who cleanses and burns the sin out. The Lord's second coming is the fire that will remove the wicked from the earth. So it must pass through a similar process that you and I do so that it become a celestial world. It has to become sanctified from all unrighteousness that it may be prepared for the celestial glory. Okay, that's its destiny. When the earth was created, it was created in mind, it will become a celestial planet. It fell and it must start its long ascension back. Before it starts its ascension back, it must be baptized. It must be cleansed by fire. Then it will be renewed into another heaven, into a terrestrial paradisical world as it starts its ascension back up by Kolob. Eventually it will die, be resurrected, and the Son of God will return a celestial world 
an exalted world with an exalted family back to God the Father. So we understand the process. We at least glimpse it. For after it filled the measure of its creation, it shall be crowned with glory even with the presence of God the Father. Now, who can imagine what that will be like when we're finally returned back to our Father in Heaven's exalted family? We will see Him. He will come to an exalted planet that we're now on, that His Holy Son, through His atonement, has brought to pass our exaltation. And He will love and teach us in person, and we will come to know Him. 20, that bodies who are of the celestial kingdom may possess it forever and uh, ever. For for this intent was it made and created. And for this intent are they sanctified. The antecedent of they is back up there in 17, the poor and the meek. So you have to learn to connect those so you don't get confused. They are the faithful members of the church called the poor and the meek. And I told you what the terms mean. They must be sanctified, how? By baptism and by fire, the cleansing power of the Holy Ghost. So we understand that process. They who are not sanctified through the law, the law is the gospel, which I've given unto you, even the law of Christ. And it's called his plan. And the reason it is, brothers and sisters, it's the Father's plan. We know that. But Christ fully understood it, agreed to every aspect of it, and now can say what? It's my plan also. Okay? Must inherit another kingdom. And then he goes on, terrestrial, telestial. But come down in 24, in the middle of it. Therefore, if you can't abide a telestial, therefore he must abide a kingdom which is not a kingdom of glory. Charles Penrose said that means exactly what it says. It is a kingdom of darkness. And who could begin to imagine what that's all about? Joseph Fielding Smith said this, and then I'll give you the reference for it. He said, the extent of this punishment, sons of perdition, none will ever know except those who partake of it. That it is the most severe punishment that can be meted out to man is apparent. Outer darkness is something which cannot be described except that we know that it is to be placed beyond the benign and comforting influence of the Spirit of God, banished entirely from His presence. Who could begin to fathom what that means or to even to understand something like that? Remember in section 76, the Savior told Joseph Smith, He showed that unto many, and then He what? He shut it up, which means this, if we could talk to Joseph Smith and say, did you see that realm? He would say, yes. What was it like? And he would say, I don't know. All I can remember was horrible. In other words, God didn't want him having to think and think and focus on something as terrible as this is. That quote I read is Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, page 220. Volume 2, page 220. Now, 26, again, verily I say unto you, the earth abideth the law of a celestial kingdom, for it filleth the measure of its creation and transgresseth not the law. Wherefore it, earth, shall be sanctified. Yet notwithstanding it, earth shall die. It, earth, shall be quickened, that means resurrected, again, and shall abide the power by which it, earth, is quickened, which power is celestial. And the righteous shall inherit it. Joseph Fielding Smith said that term in scriptures, when you read that righteous, has reference to faithful members of the church. Here is the reference for that. Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1, page 74, and Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, page 230. Volume 1, 74, Volume 2, 230, a term used for faithful members. That's an important one to catch because it will unlock some interesting things in the book of Alma for you if you pick up on what that word means. 27, for notwithstanding they die, the antecedent is righteous in 26, faithful members, they also shall rise again a spiritual body, which is a term for a resurrected body. 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 44. 1 Corinthians 15, 44. Now it becomes confusing. And if it wasn't for the help of Joseph Smith and Joseph Fielding, we wouldn't understand this. They who are of a celestial spirit shall receive the same body, meaning a celestial body, which was a natural body or which at one time was a mortal body. Even ye shall receive your bodies. Your glory shall be that glory by which your bodies are quickened, resurrected. Ye who are quickened, this is where it's confusing, by a portion of the celestial glory shall then receive the same even of fullness. I used to wonder, what does that mean that we're quickened by a portion? <clears throat> and thanks to Joseph Smith, I understand what it means. He said, even after you're resurrected with a celestial body, you would be a long time into eternity before you know enough to act like God, let alone do what he does. We will have celestial bodies, which means we can endure the presence of exalted celestial beings. But to have the fullness of what they have will take a long, long time. And that's all right. Believe it or not, you're going to be someplace in a long, long time. Why not have celestial bodies being taught by exalted beings and enjoying the life that they enjoy versus in lower realms? Uh, I mentioned once in a preaching meeting, I can never remember in my life from time, even when I was a little boy, I can never remember getting up and thinking to myself, I hope I can at least get in the terrestrial kingdom. That has never entered my heart, not one single time. I've only thought about the celestial and have hoped that one day I can be uh, in the celestial kingdom with the faithful members of the church. And I know that it is possible or God wouldn't have put us through this. Here are the references if you want them. For that 29, Teachings of Joseph Smith, page 348, Teachings 348, Joseph Ilian Smith is Doctrines of Salvation, and that one is volume 2, page 18. Those two references unlock that verse 29 so that we can now understand it. He goes on and explains, if you can't abide celestial, then terrestrial, celestial, and so forth. Then come down to 32. They who remain shall also be quickened. Nevertheless, they shall return again to their own place to enjoy that which they're willing to receive because they were not willing to enjoy that which they might have received. He speaks of perdition. That verse 32 clarifies Doctrine Covenant 76, verse 38 and 39, which has been a stumbling block to members of the church. So verse 32, perdition, clarifies DNC 76, verse 38 and 39. Now note of perdition. For what doth it profit a man if a gift is bestowed upon him? What gift is bestowed upon him? The gospel of Jesus Christ and the atonement of the Son of God. That's what's been bestowed upon us. If you don't like that gift, you don't want the gift, then what good is it to give it to you? And he received not the gift. Behold, he rejoices not in that which is given unto him, neither rejoices in him, Christ, who is the giver of the gift. Those who are perdition hate the Savior. And I can understand that. Uh, probably even in prayer life, we couldn't understand how they could act the way they were acting. Again, verily I say unto you, that which is governed by law is also preserved by law and perfected and sanctified by the same. That which breaketh a law abideth not by law, but seeketh to become a law unto itself, willeth to abide in sin, altogether abideth in sin, cannot be sanctified by law, which is the gospel, neither by mercy, because they won't repent, nor by justice, even the law of justice will not cause them to repent, nor judgment, therefore they must remain filthy still." And so verse 32 through 35 deals with perdition and those <coughs> who become perdition. Now, how many will there be? We have no idea. It doesn't do any good to even speculate. We were told of one, so we got a uh, could glimpse what it was he did, and that's Cain, because God said he was perdition. That one we know. Everything else 
is a guess, and that's not worth our time to be doing. There's too many other things to learn. Let's go over to verse uh, 47. Where we read, Behold, all these are kingdoms, and any man who has seen any or the least of these has seen God moving in his majesty and power. Let me just give you a glimpse of what that means. On a beautiful summer night, haven't you ever looked out at the Milky Way galaxy and all those stars and marveled at the creations of God? And we're seeing that with the human eye. That's all we can glimpse. But who can imagine a universe or even all of the Milky Way galaxy? But just to see all of that is to see God in his power and his majesty. And then we wonder where he's at, what he's doing today, how busy he must be. And uh, we long to be there and to grow and to learn and to be in his family. I say unto you, he has seen him. Nevertheless, he who came unto his own was not comprehended. And again, we ask the question, how could that possibly be? How could the Son of God walk among them and they could not feel he was greater than any man they had ever looked at or been in his presence? Were they so spiritually dead they could not tell? And I don't know the answer to that, but I know this. Galilee, even today, is a different area from Jerusalem. Lynette and I lived there for a year. I used to like to go to Galilee. There's a better spirit in Galilee. Jerusalem, we, Lynette and I got to a point we didn't even go over into Jerusalem unless we needed to because there's a heavy spirit that hangs over that place. You don't see it as a tourist if you're there for a day or two days. You're so excited to think you're there, and, and that's the way it should be, thank goodness. But live there and see what happens. And boy, you can feel it. I remember coming out of the hotel tunnel one night <coughs> with a few of the BYU students. Here was two of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, uh, and armed to the teeth. And they asked me, when you come out, then you go out to uh, uh, Lions Gate or Stevens Gate. And they said, where are you going? And I said, well, I need to go back uh, over to... Uh, the Western Wall and out Damascus Gate. And they said, do you want a, uh, a guard? Do you want us to go with you? Well, I'm smart enough to know what that means. They wouldn't be standing there and they wouldn't be asking me if I wanted them to go with me unless there's some kind of problem in that city. And I said, yes, we would appreciate it. So some was in front and some behind. And boy, you got to walk. They're in good shape. And it's quite a ways back over there. And once we went out into that plaza, they disappeared. It was gone. But they escorted us over. Well, I have no idea what was going on in Jerusalem. I just know that they were concerned. And if they're concerned, I was concerned. And I also learned if you play by the rules while you're there, you will survive and you will come home. 49, the light shineth in darkness. The darkness comprehendeth it not. Nevertheless, the day shall come when you shall comprehend even God being quickened in him and by him. That is a promise to the members of this church that the day will come when we will be quickened in him and by him through his holy power and able to abide his presence and to see him. And in the millennial reign, he will tutor us and teach us for a thousand years. He and all of the mighty ones will be here to love and to help us. Now, I'm going to summarize some of this. Verse 51 through 61 deals with 12 planets. So we'll look at just a couple of the verses. 51, behold, I will liken these kingdoms unto a man having a field. The field is the world. He sent forth his servants, prophets, into the field to dig in the field, to work. He said unto the first, go ye and labor in the field, and in the first hour I will come unto you. You shall behold the joy of my countenance. This is what it deals with. Orson Pratt explains it. It deals with at least 12 planets that have human beings on just like you and I. The Savior visits them in turn. Each will enjoy a millennial reign in which he will be there to tutor them and to teach them. Which number we're at in there? I have no idea. Here's the reference where he gives some commentary. Journal of Discourses, volume 17, page 331 to 332. Now, you know what, even when I give you those references, I'm careful 
when I use the Journal of Discourses, because that doctrinally is not going to impact you one way or the other with that information. It's just helpful. Okay. Now, let me tell you why it's a concern to you and I. Who can fathom how busy the Savior must be? You and I do not want to miss the millennial reign. It is our day with the Son of God. He has many other worlds. They want to see him. They want to be in his presence. They want to hear him and be tutored by him, just like we do. You and I do not want to miss the millennial reign. It will come. It doesn't matter whether we're still mortals or we've gone into the paradise. We will all be part of that great day. He won't miss any of us and we'll be able to participate. But we do not want to miss this great millennial reign. Let's go to verse uh, 66. Behold, that which you hear is as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. In the wilderness, because you cannot see him. He keys off of Mark chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Who was it that cried in the wilderness to prepare for Christ? It was John called the Baptist. He laid the groundwork and the preparation for the Son of God for when he came. Now we come to our day. Who is it that now cries in the wilderness to prepare us for the coming of Christ? Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith laid the foundation, prepared us. He cried as though in the wilderness in a time of great apostasy to bring us into the line to prepare us. Other prophets have continued to help, even down now to President Nelson, who helps to prepare us to see the face of the Son of God and to enjoy being in his presence. 67, and if your eye be single to my glory, explained in Moses 1, verse 39, <clears throat> your whole body shall be filled with light. There shall be no darkness in you, and that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. That's explained in verse 41 that we have looked at. Therefore, sanctify yourselves. How? By keeping the commandments. That's how we sanctify ourselves as members. We keep the commandments. That your minds become single to God, and the days will come, you shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto you. That is a promise to the members of this church. I would put by it Doctrine and Covenants 93, verse 1. We will look at that when we get there, but it lists five things you must do to see the face of the Son of God. DNC 93, verse 1. Very helpful reference. Verse 70. Tarry ye, tarry ye in this place, Kirtland. Call a solemn assembly, even of those who are the first laborers in this last kingdom. A solemn assembly is held for three reasons. Here they are. They're held, number one, for the dedication of temples. Number two, special instructions to priesthood leaders. Maybe some of you in here have been in a solemn assembly with the prophets. Number three, to sustain a new president of the church. Here is the reference where it's explained. David B. Haight, Enzyme, November 1994, page 14. Enzyme. November 1994, page 14. 73, behold, I'll hasten my work in its time. We now turn to President Russell M. Nelson, who said this. Political changes have occurred recently in many countries. Previous restrictions of personal liberties have been relieved. The shell of spiritual confinement has been shattered. Swelling shouts of freedom fill the air. Surely the hand of the Lord is apparent. He said, I will hasten my work in its time, and that time of hastening is now. Note when he said this, conference report, April 1990, 30 years ago, page 19, April 1990, page 19. Let's come now to uh, 77. 
I give unto you a commandment that you shall teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom. Note that. That burden rests on all of us. We are to teach each other the doctrine of the kingdom. How do you do that? Well, you can do it best in your home with your own family. That's the best place to do it. But there are other avenues, too. The seminaries, the institutes help us and perform a major uh, uh, work with that. But if your teachers in any of the organizations prepare your lessons well, be prayerful and thoughtful, and you'll bless the lives of the saints by doing so. He says, 78, teach ye diligently. Diligently means to be consistent and to be steady. And my grace shall attend you. That means that we'll be able to understand that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the law of the gospel, and all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God that are expedient for you to understand. And with that, we add the note, avoid the mysteries. Those are a waste of time. A simple one I think I've mentioned before is, is Judah's perdition. What a waste of time to work on that one. Uh, I, my response to that is I hope he isn't. I would never wish that on anybody, but why spend time on that? Uh, where are the lost tribes? It took me years to get smart enough to quit working on that one. I have a thick folder of what it, all of the early leaders of the church had to say about it, and they all are very somewhat. So I concluded one day that when God said they were lost, that's exactly what he meant. So I haven't worked on it anymore. And one of the days, these days, he'll explain it. Where was the city of Zarahemla? Is it in North America? Is it in Central, South? There are books uh, written by scholars uh, showing that it's in all those areas. Why waste time on that? Learn the message of the Doctrine and Covenants. The Savior will take five minutes and give you uh, a geography lesson, and that'll take care of that. It'll show you exactly where everything was. So I think I'm going to be patient. It's taken me a long time to learn that. To be patient on some things, knowing the Savior will explain it by and by. He says, the things both in heaven, astronomy, and in the earth, under the earth, things which have been history, things which are current events, things which must shortly come to pass. That's prophecies. You should, we should study those. Things which are at home, things which are abroad, the wars, the perplexities of the nations, the judgments which are on the land, and the knowledge also of countries and of kingdoms. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be scholars in all of those areas, but we should have some general understanding of many of those. And maybe there's some of those that are more interest to you than others. And collectively, we cover all of them, do we not? As members of the church, we collectively will cover all of those and be able to help each other. 81. Behold, I send you out to testify and warn the people. It becometh every man who hath been warned to warn his neighbor. That is a duty or a responsibility that rests on members of the church. Now, how do we do that? I'll tell you the best way there is to do that. Just keep the commandments and be friendly and say hello. You do not have to go tracting in your area and knock on the doors. You don't have to GQ everybody that you see. Just keep the commandments and be good neighbors, and you'll be surprised what happens. Lynette and I had two missionaries. They shared this with us that uh, they decided just to track down the street, and uh, they knew a member lived on the one side, but as they went down, uh, a lady come to the door, and they told her who they, they were. She says, oh, we're interested. We're very interested. She said, I'll bet you don't know it. But just on the other side of this street and up a few houses, there's a member of your church. And we have been watching their family for a long time. And we see how they treat each other. And we are so intrigued. We wanted to learn, but we didn't dare go ask them. Now, are they at fault over that? Goodness, no. They were such a good example that when those elders knocked on the door, uh, she was ready to listen. And she said, my husband isn't here and he wants to learn too. So will you come back tonight? And so they did and taught and baptized all of them, all because a family kept God's commandments. And to me, that's the key. 82, therefore, they are left without excuse. Their sins are upon their own heads. 
The discourse on verse 82 is Ezekiel chapter 3 and chapter 33, which should be studied by the members of the church, Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. Okay, let's go down to 85. That their souls may escape the wrath of God, the desolation of abomination which awaits the wicked, both, now note, both in this world and the world to come. Have you noticed then, death doesn't get you out of things? If we're not repentant in this life, you will straighten it out on the other side of the veil. I was in a setting with Elder Marion D. Hanks one time, President Paul and myself, and I heard him say, he said, you know, justice sometimes is really slow in coming, but he said, you better believe it comes, and no one's going to escape it and know what the Lord said. If it doesn't catch you here, it will on the other side, and no one's going into any kingdom of glory until they're clean. Now, it can become clean by ordinances and repentance, or we can suffer. And we don't want to go that route. None of us want to do that. He said, which waits the, the wicked. Verily I send you, let those who are not the first elders continue in the vineyard. Now I'm going to show you something about the first elders in a minute. Till the mouth of the Lord shall call them, for their time is not yet come. Their garments are not clean from the blood of this generation. So we'll, we'll come back to the verse and I'll explain what it means. Abide ye in the liberty wherewith ye are made free. Entangle not yourselves in sin, and that is a good word. To entangle means to complicate. And when we commit sin, it can become a complicated mess and in a hurry. But let your hands be clean. Why the hands be clean? Because they are associated with action, with action, until the Lord comes. Now, no, not many days hence the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro as a drunken man, the sun shall hide his face, shall refuse to give light. The moon shall be bathed in blood. The stars shall become exceedingly angry, shall cast themselves down. I would note by that Ezekiel 38, 19 to 20, which uh, explains that verse. There will come an earthquake so violent that it will shake the entire planet that we live on. Joseph Fielding Smith said he believes that's when God moves the continents back together, which throws the earth's equilibrium off, which would cause what? Tidal waves, earthquakes, eruptions, cities sinking out of sight, gas lines breaking, and so forth. And that appears that that's what this is about. And after your testimony cometh wrath and indignation upon the people. For after your testimony come a testimony of earthquakes. In other words, the Lord will first send his servants to teach. If they reject them, he will go to another plan, which is the elements in commotion, to see if they will not humble themselves and listen when that happens. Verse 9, he cometh a testimony, the voice of thunderings and lightnings, and I don't know if you've ever had uh, the thunder hit close to you, but boy, that can scare you in a hurry uh, when that takes place. Uh, let's see, because of time, let's go over here to uh, 95. There shall be silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. If that's God's time, we're talking about probably 22 years in which all of these things that happen, the earth in commotion, the wars, appears that maybe that it stops to give mankind now time to think. Will you now change your course and repent before he finally comes? Then he says, and immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded. The curtain of heaven is the veil that covers the earth. Now here comes one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. And the saints, no, not members of the church, saints. All uh, members are not saints. All saints are members. And the saints that are upon the earth who are alive, mortals, shall be quickened, changed, caught up to meet him, Christ. They, saints who have slept in their graves, they live in the spirit world, shall come forth. Their graves shall be opened. They also shall be caught up to meet him, Christ, in the midst of the pillar of heaven. They, saints on both sides of the veil, are Christ, the first fruits. Now note, they who shall descend with him. 
He does not descend in his glory until all of the saints have been taken into his presence. Then we descend with him to cleanse the earth by fire. Who could begin to comprehend what that will be like? And what a special privilege and blessing that is. Moses chapter 7, 63 to 64 also deals with that. And the return of Enoch and his people and the coming together of all of us for that great uh, millennial day. We will descend with the Savior. Now, I'm going to miss some more here so I can. I, my goal is to get through section 89 tonight if I can. So. Uh, I'll miss the trumpets and the angels. I'll let you work on it. Come over to verse 118. He said, and as all have not faith, seek ye diligently, teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Now, the best way to learn, the best way, if you want to know about Enoch and his city, would be to cross the veil and talk to Enoch. Would that not be the best way? I mean, you can't beat that. But the Savior says, because you don't have the faith at this point, and he's not chastising, he understands, then this is what you'll need to do. One, you must teach each other, help each other. And two, you must study the best books. By doing so, you will grow in faith to the perfect day when you can see all of these people. And we can talk to Mother Eve about the Garden of Eden. Probably have some questions about that you'd like to ask her. She'd be a really good authority on that and to visit with her. It'd be wonderful to talk to Noah and to talk to him about the flood and, and the building of the ark and so forth and so many other things. Methuselah, Joseph Smith said he was one of the great astronomers of the earth. That's well, not in the Old Testament any place. And it comes out of his Egyptian grammar book. That would be interesting to talk to him about that. Okay, study the best books. Now, how do you know what they are? I'll give you two ways. One, the brethren now at the end of their conference talks will source uh, often where they've taken some material. Usually it's just scriptures or they've quoted each other, but occasionally you'll see that they'll list a book. Write those down. The second way is ask people that you have confidence in that understand bibliography, who are students of history and of the scriptures, and ask them, is this a good book and is this worth time to look at? Because not all books are worth your time. So I just offer that as a suggestion. Now, verse 121 through 126 is where the Savior lists requirements to be part of the temple dedication and to be in the house of God. It's a list to prepare one for the solemn assembly and to prepare one for the temple. So I give you a challenge tonight. You work through those 121 through 126 and make a list of what he requires to be in the temple. Now, you don't have to be perfect at it, but it's a list that you and I can work on. So I hope you take it that way. Let's go to 127. Again, the order of the house prepared for the presidency of the school of the prophets. Let me speak to you for a minute about the school of the prophets. This explains the verse I mentioned to you. Only the first elders of the church are invited to attend the school of the prophets. The school of the prophets was held in Newell K. Whitney's store on the second level. There's a room set apart for them. The instructor in the school often was Orson Hyde, always Joseph Smith, and sometimes also Sidney Rigdon. The School of the Prophets commenced on January 24, 1833. There were 22 men in the school of, that we know of. There could have been others. Of the 22, Zebedee Coltrane said 20 of them used tobacco. Now, here comes the question. So who are the two that didn't use it? Was Joseph Smith one? We just, we've got to know. Was he one of those that didn't? I don't know. And I don't have any interest to figure out who the two were either. Uh, that was a different time period, was it not? All I know is what Zebedee Coltrane said. So let's make a list 
of what was revealed in the school of the prophets. One, that's where the word of wisdom was given to the church by the prophet. Zebedee Coltrane said, Joseph Smith told us, those who used tobacco, we could ease off by using black licorice root. And that doesn't sound very good to me. I don't know what that is, but I don't think it sounds good. A second thing that they learned in the school was the true order of the sacrament. Zebedee Coltrane said the prophet taught them that when the Savior instituted the sacrament in the New Testament, that the format for it was they took warm loaves of small loaves of bread. Then you broke a chunk off about the size of your fist. Then they took a cup of wine and they would sip the wine and eat the bread. And that's how the true order was. Well, in our day, that has been, the format's been changed and we should be okay with the brethren doing that. A third thing that was revealed is the true order of prayer, which is taught in the temple today. The true order of prayer. Another one, the first presidency of the church were set apart in the school of the prophets. And then the last one, the father and the son appeared in the school of the prophets. Zebedee Coltrane uh, gives a description of both father and son who appeared in the school. On October 11th, 1883, John Taylor called Zebedee Coltrane to attend the school of the prophets on Temple Square in the endowment house. All the general authorities were in attendance and about 13 state presidents. One of those was a state president for Morgan. At which time John Taylor quizzed him about the vision and how they were dressed. And Zebedee Coltrane explains what it was that he saw. Joseph Smith then told Zebedee Coltrane and the others who saw the father and son, you stand in the same position I do as apostolic witnesses because you have seen them. So that was the most sacred thing that happened in the school. And then the washing of feet was given. And brothers and sisters, here's what we know. And this is all we should ever teach about it. So starting with verse 138. You shall not receive any among you into the school, save he's clean from blood of this generation. He shall be received by the ordinance of the washing of feet. For unto this end was the ordinance of the washing of feet instituted. And again, the ordinance of washing feet is to be administered by the president, presiding elder of the church. It's to be commenced with prayer, and after partaking of bread and wine, he is to gird himself according to the pattern given in the 13th chapter of John's testimony concerning me. Amen. Okay, that's what we know about it. That's all that we should teach about the washing of feet. If we don't fully understand it, that's okay. Peter didn't either. Remember when the Savior was going to wash his feet? He refused. He said, you are not going to wash my feet. They wore sandals. Their feet was filthy. And the Savior said, if I wash you not, you don't have part in my kingdom. And then Peter, who doesn't understand, said, not just my feet, my whole body. And the Savior then has to explain to him that he will come to understand what it is he's doing. Well, if there's more involved with that, then let's just be patient. The Lord's told us what he wanted to tell us. And so in any church setting, that's what we're going to teach, and that is only what we will teach. Let's go now to section 89 to the word of wisdom. Verse 1, a word of wisdom for the benefit of the council of high priests. That has reference to the school of the prophets that I just told you. Assembled in Kirkland in the church and also the saints in Zion. To be sent greeting, not by commandment or constraint, but by revelation and the word of wisdom, showing forth the order and will of God. Now, brothers and sisters, the Savior does uh, give something like that and say, now, if you feel good about it, uh, please live, live it. Uh, if you don't feel good about it, then that's okay, too. That's not the context of that. Let me share with you what President Joseph S. Smith said. He said, if I may be indulged just a moment, the reason undoubtedly why the word of wisdom was given as not by commandment or restraint was that at that time, at least, if it had been given as a commandment, it would have brought every man addicted to the use of these noxious things under condemnation. So the man, uh, uh, the Savior will then uh, tell them 
that they are not uh, at that point under commandment to live in. He gives them a period of time. Joseph F. goes on and he says, the Lord was merciful and gave them a chance to overcome before he brought them under the law. Later on, it was announced from this stand by President Brigham Young that the word of wisdom was a revelation and a command of the Lord. The reference for that is Joseph S. Smith Conference Report, October 1913, page 14. October 1913, page 14. President Kimball also speaks on that. It was Brigham Young who made it a commandment. And that's the teachings of Spencer W. Kimball, page 201. Okay, verse 3. Given for a principle with a promise, Boyd K. Packer said, the promise, of course, is personal revelation. So he's explained what that means. The reference for that is mine errand from the Lord, page 205. That is a book worth owning. Uh, President Packer gives so many insights in that book. Mine errand from the Lord, 205. For behold, verily thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of evils and designs, he warns us. I could have brought with me, but I knew we wouldn't have time to do this. At one time, uh, you don't see these quite as much anymore. I cut out some of the ads with a word of wisdom. It shows things like a beautiful, beautiful woman with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth or a, a rugged cowboy with a package of Marlboros. Do you remember some of those that you'd see? It's like saying if you want to be a rugged cowboy, you have to what? Got to smoke. Uh, if you want to be beautiful physically, you have to have a cigarette. Clever advertisement. There is another one that shows people dressed in tuxedos, and they're uh, advertising Seagram of liquor, saying we want them to be educated, to know that it's okay to take a social drink occasionally. We wouldn't have it any other way. And just on and on it goes. I have a whole folder just full of those things, of the wicked and their clever uh uh, ads to get people to, to use this stuff. Okay, verse 7, and again, strong drinks are not for the belly, but for the washing of your bodies. The best reference on that is Hiram Smith, Times and Seasons, Volume 3, page 800. Times and Seasons, Volume 3, 800, where he says that those hot drinks was tea and coffee. Brigham Young, he's kind of witty with it. He says they weren't boiling water and drinking it in that day, and it has a reference to tea and coffee. That's Journal of Discourses, volume 13, page 277, 13, 277. President Nelson also speaks on it, that it's tea and coffee. Conference report, October 1988, page 8. Conference report, October 1988, page 8. Verse 10, and again, verily I send to you all wholesome herbs. Wholesome herbs are vegetables and plants that we can consume. Verse 11, every herb in the season thereof and every fruit in the season thereof. 12, yea, flesh also of beasts and of the fowls. And note he says, nevertheless, they are used sparingly. Now, it doesn't mean what you think. In that day, they did not have the refrigeration that we have. So the Lord told them to use it sparingly and to be careful with it. Today, uh, we don't have a problem with that. And I would put by that this reference, Boyd K. Packer, Conference Report, April 1996, page 23. Conference Report, April 1996, page 23 where he helps us with using meat sparingly. Let's go over to 18. All saints who remember to keep and do these saints, walk in obedience to the commandments, here's the promises, shall receive health in their navel and marrow to their bones. The navel is the original source of strength to every person born. So that's why the navel's there. I would put by it Proverbs 3, verse 7 and 8. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8. Marrow to the bones denotes a vibrant, healthful living. A vibrant, healthful living. A reference, James E. Faust, Conference Report, April 1992, page 7. 
Verse 19, she'll find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge. Daniel chapter 1, he personifies that verse. Shall run and not be weary, shall walk and not faint. And I, the Lord, give unto them a promise. The destroying angel shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. Again, doesn't mean what you think. Because we key off of Exodus 12, verse 23 and 29, where the destroying angel went through Egypt and physically killed the firstborn. That's not what that means. It means we will not die spiritually. And it's not just the word of wisdom. I realize I went kind of fast. But 18 says, walk in obedience to the commandments. If you receive that promise in 21, you'll have kept more than the word of wisdom. You keep all of the commandments. And you will not die spiritually. The reference for that is Boyd K. Packer, Conference Report, April 1996, page 24. April 1996, 24. And now finally in summary. Heber J. Grant said, the word of wisdom would solve the economic problems of every country if it were obeyed by the people of the world. What a statement. And that's conference report, April 1936, page 48. April 1936, page 48. And I close in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for the opportunity to have been here tonight and to learn it at the feet of uh, Brother Stevens. We're grateful for the life he's lived and for his example in teaching. We're also very grateful for the gift of the Holy Ghost and pray that we may truly receive that gift in our lives and be taught from on high. We pray that we may return home safely this evening and that we may strive diligently to keep thy commandments in all things and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you turn it on?